So hi everyone and welcome to our eighth Inspiration Exchange session. My name is Nick Maxfield. I handle the Van der Schaar Labs communications and I'll be moderating today's session. I'm also joined by Mihaila van der Schaar and by a number of the members of our lab who will be supporting the participative discussion we have in the latter half of today's session. So to give you an idea of what to expect from today's session, uh, as always, our ongoing aim with Inspiration Exchange is to share and explore the breadth of topics in machine learning for healthcare and to generate new ideas for future research. Um, some of you will remember that in our previous session, uh, we kind of went through a range or introduced a range of new and exciting developments in ML for healthcare. Um, this time, we'll be taking a little bit more of a focused approach, and this will actually be the first of three deep dive sessions on individualized treatment effect inference or ITE inference, which is a key research area for our lab. Um, in the next session, we'll be looking at ITE inference for time series, and in the subsequent session, we'll be kind of delving into a range of um, advanced topics. This time, we'll be looking a little bit more at theory and fundamentals. Um, in this session, we'll have a couple of presentations by and a participative discussion with uh, some of our researchers in our lab. Um, so to break this down for you time-wise, um, the first five minutes, I'll be giving a quick intro, and then we'll go into these presentations by our lab members. These will take about half an hour in total, and they'll really lay the groundwork for the participative discussion on IT inference that we'll have in the latter half of the session. And this will probably run for about 25 minutes. Um, so the, the participative discussion, it's kind of, um, Mihaila will raise a few topics uh, on ITE inference and initially discuss them with some of our lab members, but we very much encourage you in the audience to also uh, to get involved with your questions, opinions, and your, your views, or even if you disagree with what's being said. Um, but the way to do this in this case, unlike our previous Inspiration Exchange sessions, is not to post your questions into our Slack channel, but rather to raise your hand in Zoom um, when we're discussing these topics so that we can see you immediately and call on you. Um, we'll also try to leave a bit of time for more general questions at the very end of the session, um, but that will depend on, on how much time we've given to the discussion itself. And then uh, we'll probably wrap up about one hour in with some closing words from me. But before we get started with that, I just wanted to give you an introduction to um, some of the resources our lab has produced on the topic of IT inference. The first of these is a kind of primer or written overview. Um, it's an introduction to ITE inference as a research area. Um, it kind of highlights a number of points like the importance of ITE inference, the, some of the theory, some of the challenges, some potential applications, and some key projects by our lab. And if you want to find this, you could just go to our website and click research pillars and then click individualized treatment effect inference. Another uh, resource that I'd like to point your attention to is a series of six new tutorials we've uh, recently produced on a range of topics covering everything from fundamentals to advanced topics. And these are all, each tutorial is kind of custom made for a variety of different needs and users or levels of familiarity with AI and ML. Um, in total, at the moment, we have about 20 modules. Uh, we will keep adding more as time goes on and as we keep developing new approaches and methods in ITE inference. And so far we have eight lab members who've contributed to these. So it is very much a group effort which reflects how important this topic is um, as a research area to us. If you want to find these videos, you can either find them on YouTube. Um, basically on our YouTube channel, we have a playlist dedicated to each uh, tutorial. Or you can go to our website and simply click tutorials and individualized treatment effect inference and everything is kind of collected together there on the same page. Anyway, without further ado, um, I'd like to go into our presentations by our lab members. As I mentioned, we have two of these and they'll last roughly um, half an hour combined. Our first presentation is by Mihaila and it's kind of an introduction um, covering some of the formalisms, key concepts, theories and uh, more. So um, let me just get that ready for you. I'm Mihaela van der Schaar, and I would like to welcome you to this tutorial on individualized treatment effect inference. This tutorial is focused on our own slab research on individualized treatment effect inference. We do not aim to provide a comprehensive introduction to the topic of causal inference for which many good resources exist inclusively my own personal favorite, the causal inference what if book by Hernan and Robbins. We would like to acknowledge that of course, extensive related work exists in statistics and econometrics. 
Let me now start with a high level problem introduction. Our focus is on delivering personalized therapeutics. We want to estimate the effect of a treatment or intervention on an individual. Let us assume that Mary was just diagnosed with a particular disease. We would like then to estimate which treatment or intervention is best for Mary. We would like to estimate individualized treatment effects. And on the basis of this information, determine what treatment plan is best for Mary. So let us assume that Mary was just diagnosed with breast cancer. At the time of her diagnosis, a lot of information is collected about Mary. On the basis of this information, we can estimate what treatments are best for Mary. We can determine this with respect to different endpoints, different outcomes of interest. For instance, probability of five-year survival. We can also look at other types of outcomes, inclusively adverse outcomes. We can look, for instance, at the recurrence of a tumor or side effects in terms of toxicity, as well as other competing risks, such as cardiovascular disease. On the basis of the information that we have available and the outcome of interest, we can then estimate what would be the effect of giving a particular treatment, for instance, chemotherapy, as opposed to giving no treatment. Also, we can look at continuous treatments, such as the optimal dosage of chemotherapy that should be given to Mary. And we can estimate on the basis of the data that we have available, the best treatment plan for Mary. Current treatment decisions are based on randomized controlled trials. But it is well known that um, treatment effects are often heterogeneous. So randomized controlled trials, which are focusing on average treatment effects, are not going to necessarily identify the best treatment which should be given to a specific patient given their individualized characteristics. So randomized controlled trials are and will remain the golden standard of determining the efficacy of treatments. However, they have limitations in terms of personalized therapeutics because they focus on the average treatment effects at the population level. They enroll small sample sizes. Often not representative patients are enrolled in a trial. So patients that may have comorbidities or are elderly are often not enrolled. Also, clinical trials are often focused on very specific questions and may not be uh, looking at a variety of outcomes and outcomes over time, and are also unable to capture the complexity of care. For instance, the treatment of other comorbidities and the evolution of the patient over time. Randomized controlled trials are also time-consuming, costly, and in certain scenarios that may be unethical. In contrast, we can also learn individualized treatment effects from observational or randomized controlled trial data. In this case, if we are using observational data, we can use large sample sizes, which include representative patients and capture many aspects of care. Because we can learn effectively using machine learning from such data, they can be fast, inexpensive, and can provide scalable and adaptive implementations. IT estimation can complement randomized controlled trials. For instance, before a randomized controlled trial, we can determine which patients would most benefit from receiving a new drug and decide to enroll these patients in the trial. Also, during a randomized controlled trial, we can identify which subgroup of patients are best responding to this treatment and enroll these patients in subsequent part of the trial. Or look at what is the optimal dosage to give to different subgroups of patients and progress the trial on the basis of this knowledge. After a randomized controlled trial took place, we can do post hoc analysis of clinical trials using these methods to identify subgroups which are responding differently to the drug. Then after the drug or intervention is adopted in clinical practice, we can estimate on the base basis of observational data 
what treatment we should give to what patient and when. Also, this relates to the topic of adaptive clinical trials. In this tutorial series, we are not going to talk about the role of machine learning in designing next generation randomized controlled trials. However, this represents an important research topic for our group, and you can read more about this on our website. The goal of this tutorial is mainly on estimating the effect of a treatment on an individual and doing so from observational data, offline observational data, which can be gathered, for instance, in electronic health records, disease registries, et cetera. And this is difficult because of the confounding and bias present in observational data. So we need to formalize this problem as a causal inference problem. The question of estimating individualized treatment effects for a patient is a causal inference problem. We have patient characteristics, interventions, and outcomes associated with the various interventions. In this part of the tutorial, I'm going to describe the problem formulation for individualized treatment effects and describe why it is difficult and different from supervised learning. So we have observational data electronic health records data or disease registries, which is collected from actual clinical practice. In this observational data, we have patient features, treatment assignments, and outcomes. For the sake of simplicity, I'm going to assume here that we are having only binary treatments. The patient was treated or not treated. However, the technologies and methods that we are describing in the later part of the tutorial can be applied to more than two treatments. And what we can see in observational data is that we see the outcome associated with a specific intervention. So for instance, if a patient X1, given their unique characteristic, was not treated, we observe the outcome given this particular decision. We do not observe the counterfactual. We do not observe what would have happened to these patients with feature X1 if they would have been treated. Also, it is important to note that observational data depends on clinical practice. It is not a randomized controlled trial. Hence, it has selection bias. The clinicians and doctors that are deciding on interventions and treatments for these patients are not going to close their eye and decide whether to treat or not a patient. They are going to use their own knowledge to determine how to treat this particular patient. So we need to learn in the presence of such bias in the observational data. The causal effect inference problem, hence, has several challenges. First, we do not have counterfactuals. Yet, we need to answer causal effect inference problems where we need to estimate the missing counterfactuals. So as shown in this particular case, we only observe the outcomes for the treatment or intervention given and not the counterfactual. Yet to estimate true causal effects, we need to have an estimate of this, causal, uh, of this um, counterfactual to estimate the effect of interventions. This represents a complicated machine learning problem which unlike the predictive problem uh, of supervised learning, doesn't have an explicit label. Also additional challenges for causal effect inference as opposed to supervised machine learning is that we do not have only features and labels, patient covariates and outcomes. We also have interventions, W, and we need to decide how to model these interventions. More on this in the later part of this tutorial. As I mentioned, observational data has also selection bias, also known as covariate shift, and we need to learn in the presence of this. We are casting this problem in the framework of the potential outcome defined by Neyman and Rubin. We have observational data containing patient features, treatment assignment, and potential outcomes. Because we are in the binary treatment setting here, we have two potential outcomes, 
the treated outcome and the control outcome. We observe the factual outcome, but we do not observe the counterfactual outcome. We will need to estimate that. We are also estimating the individualized treatment effect given the unique characteristics of the patient. So the focus in this part of the tutorial is not on average treatment effects, but rather on individualized treatment effects, also known as conditional average treatment effects. And they are known under this name because we are conditioning or personalizing on the patient features XI. So given these features of the patient, we are going to estimate the outcome for different types of interventions and estimate the difference between out these outcomes as well. The potential outcome framework makes two assumptions of no unmeasured confounders or also known as uh, ignorability. So there will be no hidden confounders that uh, we have in the observational data and common support. There are no patients with features X for which we do not have patients that are treated or not treated. Covariate adjustment is used for both average treatment effects as well as individualized treatment effects. We are explicitly modeling in this case the relationship between treatments, confounders, and outcomes. And we have response surfaces associated with the treatment, the treated and the um, control population. And we are going to estimate these treatment responses from data. We also can estimate the causal effects by using this covariate adjustment solution. How can machine learning help? Different solutions already exist for covariate adjustment, for instance, based on statistical methods or, causal of, or econometrics methods. However, machine learning can help further this agenda because we can determine very flexible end-to-end -end architectures to learn the different response surfaces. We also can learn to uh, model effectively the treatment assignment variable. We have a large variety of flexible architectures that can model in different ways um, the available data and do covariate adjustment to estimate individualized treatment effects. Also, machine learning model can be trained effectively uh, using a variety of loss functions to deal with selection bias. And indeed, there has been tremendous progress in the last five years in machine learning for individualized treatment effects. For instance, in binary treatments with the early work by Shalit, Johansson, and Sontag. Then a lot of other works exist in machine learning, inclusively our own work uh, using deep learning methods, but also multitask Gaussian processes, deep kernel learning. We also gone beyond binary treatments and looked at multiple treatments, continuous treatments, inclusively dosage, treatment effects over time, etc. In this part of the tutorial, I'm going to describe an illustrative model from our group for, um, based on machine learning for individualized treatment effect inference. This algorithm is called Gunite. And the reason I would like to highlight it here is that it's enabling estimation of individualized treatment effects from multiple treatments. So we are no longer in the binary treatment regime where the patient was either treated or not treated, but we can deal in this case with multiple treatments. As the name of the method says, Gunite, this is a method based on generative adversarial networks or GANs. And the key idea behind Gunite is simple. In order to estimate individualized treatment effects, we need to generate and synthesize counterfactuals. So we have from the observational data only the factuals. Yet in order to determine treatment effects for the individual, we need to um, synthesize counterfactuals. And for that, we are going to use a generative adversarial network, also known as GAN. And of course, GANs are very popular already in synthesizing um, and generating data. I'm not going to go into the uh, uh, 
very detailed discussion of guns here. A lot of good resources exist for that. But I'm just going to remind you that guns have been especially popular in generating um, a variety of image data as well as tabular data and are able are trained using an adversarial framework that involves a generator generating fake samples and a discriminator that needs to learn to discriminate between the real samples and the fake samples generated by the generator. And by doing so, it is training the generative model of the generator to generate significantly um, accurate data. Um, in our case, um, if we are able to generate using GANs counterfactuals effectively, and if the generated counterfactuals follow the training distributions, then indeed we should not be able to discriminate between the real and the generated outcomes. So the generated counterfactuals are going to be um, correct, and we are going to be able to estimate treatment effects from such data. But can we use GANs directly to estimate counterfactuals? The answer is no. In the observational data, we have patient features and treatments that are given to these patients as well as outcomes. However, um, in order to be able to generate counterfactuals, what we will need is access to patient features. And then we should be able to generate the potential outcomes for the different treatments. But that information is not available in observational data. So we cannot directly train a gun to issue and estimate the different potential outcomes for the different uh, treatments on the basis of the patient features X. We need to do more. So in GANITE, we'll um, use two um, generative adversarial networks and to modify it, generated adversarial networks to do so. These two modified GANs are the counterfactual block and the IT block. The modified conditional GANs generate counterfactuals conditions on real outcomes and is producing a data set that is going to be used by a second GAN to generate the full outcome distribution condition only on features. At training time, we are going to need both these two modifying guns to work um, uh, in harmony to be able to train the IT block. However, at test time, at the time gun IT is used in practice for a new patient in the training set, in the testing set, we are only going to have the IT block operating. So at testing time, we are going to just input the new patient features, for instance, Mary's features X, and synthesize the potential outcomes associated with the various treatments that can be given to Mary and estimate their outcomes. Subsequent work called SIGAN um, is proving a variety of theoretical guarantees for GANITE inclusively the fact that GANITE is able to learn through distributions. I mean... Okay, so as you'll have noticed, uh, Mihaila ended her video with the mention of SIGAN, and that's the topic of the next video, which is by Joanna Bika, one of our PhD students, and will run about 10 minutes. After this, we'll go into the participative discussion. Hi, I'm Yana Bika and I'm a PhD student at the University of Oxford and the Allen Turing Institute. In this tutorial, I'll talk about estimating the effect of continuous valid interventions from observational data using generative adversarial networks. So as we've already seen as part of this tutorial series, estimating the personalized effects of interventions is crucial for decision making in domains such as medicine. For instance, in this illustrative example here, we consider a patient with breast cancer for which we have diagnosis information such as tumor size, number of positive nodes, HER2 status, and so on, and for which we want to determine the best treatment option. However, most of the methods developed in the cultural inference literature focus on learning the counterfactual outcomes for discrete interventions such as binary or categorical treatments. 
However, in many scenarios such as healthcare, deciding how to intervene involves not only deciding between different treatment options, such as chemotherapy or radiotherapy, but also deciding on the value of some continuous parameter associated with the intervention, such as the dosage of the treatment. In the medical setting, using a high dosage for the treatment can lead to toxic effects, while using a low dosage can result in no effect on the patient outcome. Following Rubin and Neyman's potential outcomes framework, we assume that for all treatment dosage pairs W and D, there is a potential outcome. And our aim is to estimate the individualized dose response curves, which contains all of the potential outcomes, both factual and counterfactual, given the patient characteristics. Now, to be able to identify these potential outcomes from observational data, we need to make the following two assumptions, overlap and no key and confounders. Learning from observational data already presents significant challenges when there is only a single discrete intervention, and thus the decision is binary or categorical, where we need to choose between multiple treatments. This is because only the factual outcome is present in the data and the counterfactual outcomes are never observed. This problem is exacerbated in the setting of continuous interventions where the number of counterfactuals is no longer even finite. Moreover, the decision to intervene is non-random and instead depends on patient features, thus creating treatment and dosage selection bias. In our work, we introduced SIGAN, which is a novel causal inference method that can be used to estimate the effects of such continuous valid interventions. SIGAN builds on the framework of generative adversarial networks to learn the distribution of the unobserved counterfactuals. And it's illustrated here, the generator estimates individualized dose response curves. We then define a discriminator that acts on a finite set of points from each generated curve and identifies the factual outcome from the set of factual outcomes and the generated counterfactual ones. The intuition is that if a counterfactual generator and discriminator are trained adversarially, then the generator can fool the discriminator such that it will not be able to correctly identify the factual outcome by generating the potential outcomes according to their true distribution. We propose estimating individualized dose response curves by first training a counterfactual generator using a min-max adversarial game to generate response curves for each sample within the training dataset. Then, once we have trained the counterfactual generator, we can use it to only access the generated dose response curves for all samples in the dataset, thus essentially creating a complete dataset with all of the counterfactuals. Thus, the learned generator can then be used to train an inference network using standard supervised learning methods. The counterfactual generator takes as input the patient features X, the factual outcome YF, the received type of treatment WF and dosage DF, and some noise and outputs the dose response curve for each type of treatment. Since it is not possible to give us input to a discriminator the entire dose response curve, we define a discriminator that acts on a random set of points from each of the generated dose response curves. Here, we describe how we get this random set of points to give us input to the discriminator. For each treatment W, we will compare NW dosage samples. In particular, for each treatment W, we sample NW dosage levels from the dosage domain. Then, we use a generator to obtain the counterfactual outcomes for the sample dosages for each treatment W, and we form the dosage outcome pairs as indicated here. Note that for the factual treatment WF, we replace one of the dosage samples with, one, with a factual dosage TF and we use the factual outcome YF instead of the generated one. This way, we obtain a set of dosage outcome pairs for all treatment types W and we give us input to the discriminator. This uh, set of dosage outcome pairs contains the factual outcome YF and factual dosage TF for the factual treatment type WF from the observational dataset and the counterfactual ones from the generator for the sample dosages for each treatment. We illustrate here the full Harkel discriminator. So the treatment discriminator on the left takes as input the patient features X and the set of dosage outcome pairs and outputs a probability for each treatment. It is trained using the treatment discriminator loss outline here to identify the factual treatment. Then for each treatment type, different, the dosage discriminator illustrated on the right takes as input the patient features and the corresponding dosage outcome pairs and outputs a probability for each dosage level. And during training, we use the following laws for the dosage discriminator, where for each data point, we train the corresponding dosage discriminator for the factual treatment to identify the factual dosage. Finally, the overall discriminator has the output for each treatment dosage pair as described here, where we multiply the outcomes from the treatment and dosage discriminators. 
We illustrate here the overall GAN framework that we use for SPIGAN, where the counterfactual generator and discriminator are trained according to the min-max gain described here. Now, to generate those response curves for a new sample, we use the counterfactual generator along with the original dataset to train an inference network using supervised learning methods. So for the generator, we adopt a multitask deep learning model that consists of a shared layer, and then for each treatment W, we introduce a multitask head that takes as input the dosage to produce the outcome. To ensure that the discriminators can act as functions on sets of the randomly selected dosage outcome pairs, we build them as permutation invariant and permutation equivariant neural networks. In particular, the treatment discriminator receives all of the sets of dosage outcome pairs, one set for each treatment, and outputs a probability for each treatment. That is, there is only one output corresponding to each set. Thus, to build the treatment discriminator, we treat each input set of dosage outcome pairs as a vector, but we require that the output of the discriminator to be invariant to the ordering of the elements in the set. On the other hand, each dosage discriminator receives as input a set of dosage outcome pairs corresponding to a given treatment, and it is tasked with outputting a probability for each element in the set. In order to define such a function for the dosage discriminator, we consider that the input and output as vector, but then require that if we permute the elements of the input vector, then the output should be permuted in the same way. And to do this, we use permutation equivariant layers to build the dosage discriminator. The nature of the treatment effect estimation problem, even in the binary treatment setting, does not allow for meaningful evaluation on real-world datasets due to the inability to observe all counterfactuals. While there are well-established benchmark static models for the categorical treatment setting, no such model exists for a dosage setting. So we propose our own semi-synthetic data simulation model to evaluate a uh, SIGGAN against several benchmarks. We simulate data as follows. We obtain patient features X from a real data set. In our paper, we use as real data sets TCGA, NEWS, and MIMIX3. We then consider three treatments, each with the corresponding dosage. Each treatment type W is associated with a set of parameters V, which are sampled randomly for each experiment. The shape of the dose response curve for each treatment FW is given in this table here, along with the closed form expression for the optimal dosage. We assign interventions to the patient in the observational data by sampling a dosage GW for each treatment from a beta distribution with parameters alpha and beta. The parameter alpha controls the selection bias, and we set beta according to alpha and the optimal dosage for each treatment. This setting ensures that the mode of our beta distribution is the optimal dosage and the variance is as described here. We see that the variance of our beta distribution decreases with alpha, resulting in the sample dosages being closer to the optimal dosage, thus resulting in higher dosage selection bias. Given a selected dosage for each treatment, we then assign a treatment according to the categorical distribution described here, where increasing kappa increases the treatment selection bias. In terms of benchmarks comparison, we compare against the generalized propensity score, which is a GPS method here, and those response networks, the DRNet -net methods here. As a baseline, we also compare against the standard multilayer perceptron, MLP, that takes patient features, treatment, and dosage as input and estimates the patient outcomes, and a multitask variant, MLPM, that has a designated head for each treatment. Finally, for the experiments, we illustrate here the model's robustness to increasing the treatment and dosage bias. To summarize, in this tutorial, we introduced SIGAN, which is a novel causal inference framework that tackles a less studied problem of estimating the effects of continuous valid interventions. SIGAN uses a significantly modified GAN model to learn to generate counterfactual outcomes, which can then be used to learn an inference model using standard supervised methods capable of estimating these counterfactuals for a new patient. And the reference for the paper can be found here, and the code for SIGAN is publicly available, so please try it out. Thank you for listening. Hi. Okay, so now it's time for our participative discussion. Um, so to just give you an idea of how this will work, hopefully it is new to us, so it may get a little bit chaotic, but we have um, five topics for Mihaila and the lab members to discuss, but the key thing is that we really want you to join in the discussion, and we'd like you to add your points, ask questions, um, even if you disagree with us, or you know, if there's anything you think maybe we're not thinking of, or um, just any opinions or thoughts you want to share, um, please share them with us. And to do this, please raise your hand in the Zoom chat. 
Um, once you once you're finished, basically, you know, you've asked a question or shared a thought and an answer has been given and you're happy with it, then you can lower your hand. Uh, so we still don't think that you still need to say something. Um, if you do have a question that's kind of off topic, by which I mean not one of the five points um, that we'll be talking about imminently, um, then please just wait until the end to raise your hand. And if we have time, uh, we'll get to you on those more kind of general questions. Um, so anyway, here's the first of our five uh, topics. And again, raise your hand if you'd like to participate and lower your hand when you're done. Um, Mihala, do you want to sort of lead us briefly through this one? Yes, thank you so much, Nick. And as Nick said, I would very much like to encourage all of you to participate in the discussion and bring your thoughts and ideas. The first question that I prepared is actually one that we often think about. What are the different ways to evaluate different individualized treatment effect models given that we cannot observe counterfactuals. As you saw Iwana in the presentation of Saigon, she talks about the need for benchmarks for problems such as the one she describes. But this is a more general problem. How really shall we evaluate different ITE models? And maybe I start with asking some of my own students working in this area. And I see that also Tao Kao has raised um, the hand already. So maybe we can invite him to start the discussion. And then I can ask my students to continue. Hi, thank you, Mihala. This is the first mm -hmm. time I joined the group's uh, uh, sessions. It's a great uh, topic. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a, like a practitioner. I'm a machine learning engineer, but personally very interested in the state of arts the research in healthcare sector. So I, I find the, you know, the data is very important as, as you mentioned, and also Joanna mentioned, uh, you know, we only have observation, it's partially over the observation. So the counterfactual data is very important. That's why we have the GAN method to try to generate some data. So my question actually is a question. Uh, so my question is, you know, because the data we, we have is quite uh, kind of biased, as you mentioned, because you know we only have, uh, you know, we only have what's what's been captured. So I'm, I'm wondering, you know, how we can make sure, you know, you know that kind of observation is uh, reliable. I understand that we try to we're not we we're not going to say claim you know our, our model is, is good. I I understand we try to say you know what we generated is kind of for personalized thing. I, I, so my question actually is say how we can make sure you know what we generated here is more beneficial uh, in general for the whole like say for any indication for particular indication so that's that's my question thank you so thank you so i guess your question goes a little bit in the same direction to my question but also a little bit different because you mentioned bias so i like to open it to my own um, group so um, rather than take it myself so would um, alicia yarun iwana Maybe, maybe I can talk a little bit about this. So um, obviously one way to do this is to, to use synthetic data because we cannot observe any counterfactuals. But this is also an opportunity. Like if you talk about bias, maybe you can incorporate some of the known clinical bias into your synthetic data to which you want to evaluate. As an ITE model is fairly general, you, you take into account bias as a whole, but with synthetic data, if you're collaborating with clinicians, they can tell you like, okay, this is a type of bias that we usually induce in treatment selection. Maybe you can incorporate it in your in your data synthetic or in synthetic data set. And then you can evaluate explicitly against the bias that you will use your model in, in the real world. Okay, there are some assumptions, but, but you'll, you'll have to make these, I'm afraid. Anybody else? Alicia, Iwana, Shaoji, Ahmed? Yeah. Um, yeah, so maybe I can also say something. So, of course, so synthetic data is one way of going about it. And I think that, like, it's it's the best way of d doing um, evaluation right now, because you, you always, like, that's the only case where you really know the ground truth. Because um, what you could say, of course, you can, you can use, you could also use real data and at least see how well you do on predicting factuals. So, um, like, say you keep some holdout data and you look at, how well you actually predict the, the, the factual outcomes that you do observe. Um, and so there are, there are kind of two problems with this. The, the one problem is 
their selection bias. So the, the, like there's some kind of covariate shift in, in, in even in the holdout data that you're using um, um, to evaluate your models. Um, but like, let's say you had perfect importance weights that you can actually correct for, or say you have a clinical trial um, where there is no bias. So there, like that part is you can, you can kind of solve. Um, but I think what's more interesting is that even if you have unbiased data, so there's no selection bias, you still don't observe both counterfactuals. Um, and that's actually an issue because you, you can have models that fit, like you can have two models that fit equally well the um, potential outcomes, but have opposite kind of bias on Kate or on, on, well, on the individualized treatment effects. If, if you think about having two, like having two models that make the same error, but on uh, one model makes the error on in the same direction on both um, on, on both regression surfaces, where so the error actually cancels out, um, whereas the other model makes an opposite error, so the error adds up, and that's impossible. Like you cannot you cannot test for this from observational data um, ever. I think so. I think that's quite interesting um, because the, this is this to me is a problem that I don't know how to overcome. That's wonderful. We have quite a lot of participations. Uh, Diwan, would you like to join us as well? And maybe afterwards, Bernard and Josh? Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, great talk. I think um, whether it makes sense that um, I mean, uh, predicting this, uh, so what, we only have one like real ground truth uh, observation, whether uh, by evaluating the performance of the model, whether it makes sense that to divide the final evaluation into several like sub problems, for example, whether you can have um, group, a group of patients that sh share the similar characteristics and start from there, whether the first step it makes sense and then follow on, maybe there might be a chain of different uh, links and to evaluate step by step and to see what kind of errors the model make and to compare different errors different models, uh, models make. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know whether anybody from our group wants to, to interact on that and uh, Just uh, another point very related to uh, the point that was previously mentioned. Um, so on the practical side, um, one way to get more, more robust uh, uh, evaluation is to run multi-center studies. So you change the environment where you uh, evaluate the model, consider different countries, um, different hospitals and so on. And if the model is going to achieve consistently better performance, uh, then it just uh, uh, gives you confidence about the uh, model's performance. Uh, but still, it's, uh, it's, it's not a guarantee, but it's just a, as long as you um, validate it on a diverse environments, it tends to work um, well this way. Yeah. Thank you both. So I see Bernard. Oh, I, yeah. I Hi. Uh, Sorry, do I have my microphone down? Like yes, I, we can yeah, hear I you. Do. Okay, <laughs> okay, great. Uh, yeah, really great talk. Um, really interesting. Um, Mejo, I'm Jacob Foster, student actually. But so my question is about, um, yeah, so I think like in a, in a lot of this literature, people use this P he score or whatever to evaluate uh, bias, right? To basically compare the counterfactual predictions uh, to to some other way of, uh, yeah, some other way of evaluating. And I was wondering if you guys could talk a little bit about how you make those decisions to calculate like those scores. Cause it seems like there isn't a lot of consistency in the literature in terms of like, do I pick a nearest neighbor or, uh, yeah. So I was wondering if you could talk, just riff a little bit about that. And then my other question is like, it seems like there's a lot of focus on bias, uh, in this literature. And it's interesting in like the epidemiology and like social science literatures, people care a lot about the consistency of uh, estimators. So I was wondering, it doesn't have to be about consistency, but I was wondering if you guys could talk about kind of other metrics beyond bias that you think is important. Thank you. Uh, for these Thank uses. you, Bernard. Yeah. yeah. Who would like to take the two questions? I'm sure about the second question, I'll have a lot of people who would like to take it, but the first one, about PEHE and our use of it and the likes and dislikes of it or other ways? Yeah, maybe I can just start. I mean, ultimately, so the PEHE, so actually I've, I've even seen for PEHE, I've seen two definitions in used interchangeably 
um, in, in in literature even. So, but like how, how we normally use it is it's ultimately just a root mean squared error of estimation of, um, of, of the treatment effect function. And I think that's kind of a natural, that like just looking at the mean squared error is kind of a natural baseline for, for estimating any continuous function. Um, but there is actually variation in whether because so the, we, we look at conditional average treatment effects, right? Um, so we look at the expectation of the difference between the two potential outcomes. And I've seen it defined both as the error on the expected difference and, and on, as the error on the actual difference. Um, so the, there, there is like, there's very little consistency on that. So like I personally use it as the, uh, just as the root mean squared error of estimation in terms of the expected difference. Um, so, so I think that's a very good question. And I, I think there are other metrics that you can look at. I mean, a lot of papers do also report like an error on the average treatment effect, just looking at how well the model does it estimating the population. Um, but it's of course, I think technically also, like especially if you're actually estimating both response surfaces, I think it would be quite interesting to also just look at how well do you actually do at estimating the response surfaces. Um, so the, the potential outcomes themselves. Um, and I don't think, there has been a lot of discussion on what, what good metrics are, at least not in um, the machine learning literature. Um, and to go to your second point uh, in terms of bias, I th so I think there's two things. On the one hand, when we talk about bias, it's, I think it has a, also has a double meaning. So we talk a lot about selection bias, bias due to covariate shift, and then there's the statistical meaning of bias. Um, so what one would more be like kind of data bias because you have covariate shift and then the other the other is like how biased is your estimate, which is of course induced by the first one, but I think they are a little bit different. Um, and I think mainly in the machine learning literature we, we just talk about um, we just we just talk about selection bias because we don't actually really look at how unbiased our estimates really are. We just look at the, how well they perform in terms of root mean squared error. Um, there is, of and course, I some think, literature, Alicia, that does the second as well. There is oh, yeah, literature. yes, but, yeah, yeah. But I, I think like the, the majority kind of focuses on the bias coming just from the, the selection bias. Um, and in terms of, and I, I think why, why we look a lot less at consistency than the machine learning literature does is because uh, sorry, than the more statistical or epidemiology literature does, because so we're estimating entire functions, right? We're not estimating like an average treatment effect, um, but we're estimating a function. And so when you're looking at the average treatment effect, I think you're normally looking at something like root n consistency. So whether this actually like um, converges to some true parameter mean, um, but these entire functions, if like, if they're non-parametric, like sufficiently complex, you you will never like there is there there are no root consistent root and consistent estimators. So I think that's why we focus a lot less on it. I'd say. Um, I don't know in view of time if anybody else has anything to add. Just very briefly before we move to a next question. Anybody else from our side? Maybe one one small thing is to not only focus on synthetic data, but say you have data from two and different treatment selection or treatment assignment policies, then you can train on one data set, forget it, and then test on the other one and see how well you cope with a different assignment policy. This is to use only factual data. Great, thank you everyone. Josh, shall we move to you briefly and then to my next question? I'm happy that it, so much discussion was generated. So Josh, very briefly. Sure, so I wondered whether there'd be any value in rather than using fully connected layers for the prediction learning kind of um more interpretable kind of structural causal models after the counterfactual so then they can be so you you can use metrics to understand your performance of your model during training but then in testing the specific personalized recommendations could be assessed by the clinician um, but I didn't know that there was any kind of, if that had been done or if it was at all. I would let some of my students talk about that. Iwana, uh, Yarun, Xiaoji. Yeah, I mean, I do think that's a very interesting. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. 
Yeah, I was going to say that I think that's quite an interesting direction. Like currently we're not looking at estimating like the causal relationships between all of the patient covariates. Like we're only looking mainly at modeling how the patient covariates and the treatment are affecting the outcome. So the use of like fully connected layers is quite general in this in that case, like we're using them as function approximation to estimate the outcome. So like you can use different types of models that may be more interpretable. So for instance, like adding attention layers on top of the fully connected layers, that is a possibility. But what you're suggesting with estimating the entire causal graph, that is a more complex problem because for instance, we might not have access to like the distribution of the noise variables in the structural causal model. Like we have access to patient covariates, but like estimating the entire causal graph might be a more complex problem than what we're trying to solve on just estimating the potential outcomes. Yeah. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Nick, maybe you allow me to start my next question. I'm so happy that you all are discussing and engaging with this really, really, really happy. It was an experiment and seems to be a, a good one. So my second question to you all is, how can we really leverage both clinical trial data and observational data to estimate IDs? As you have seen in a lot of the presentations that I gave and Iwana gave, we mainly focused on observational data. But often we have a trial that preceded the usage of the drug. So we have both observational data as well as uh, clinical trial data. How can we use both of these data sets to, to, to do something better? So I think we have a question from uh, Camille. Yeah, I wanted to ask like what are the challenges associated with that? Why would it be inherently difficult to incorporate those two data sets like straightforwardly? So it's clear now that the two data sets are somewhat different. One uh, enroll a specific population that's quite limited. So often to be enrolled in a clinical trial, you need to fulfill certain criteria. So it's not always representative population. So only mm -hmm. a subset of features may be um, represented. Secondly, there is clearly no um, selection bias, like in the observational data. And maybe third, um, usually in these clinical trials, the population may be not followed for a very long time. So the outcomes of interest may be somewhat short or medium term. While in the observational data, we may have a much more, um, a, a longer, let's say, time series. And number four, maybe um, the clinical trial was done in one place, but maybe the drug has now been adopted and used on the basis of the trial in other countries as well, as the vaccines have shown. But there may be other reasons and there may be other differences. I don't know whether Zhao Ji, Alicia, anyone among you or any, anybody wants to add anything to, to why this may be different or challenging. So, so most of the problems that you've mentioned are more related to the distribution shift between the two types of data sets. So like the, based on the parameters of the people who get selected into, in the both data sets are just different, mm -hmm. which I guess makes- but Also maybe um, the bias that's there in one data set and not the other. And maybe the outcomes, the short term versus the long term outcomes. Mm -hmm. So, but so it's, it's just a. I'm, I'm opening it to all of you. I think that's interesting to think about these differences. And and why would it prevent like so? So if you apply like a machine learning algorithm of any type to those two distributions, so I guess like you have let's say two different distributions, and one is like observation, and one is clinical trial, and then you mix them together. Um, and then apply a machine algorithm to like this mixture of both. From, um, from 1000 feet, that seems very easy, but of course one needs to take into consideration these differences in feature mismatch, in distribution mismatch, in outcomes. I don't know, again. Yeah, maybe, maybe I can also say something. So, so even if you don't have these problems that Nihana just mentioned, I think what, like, what's interesting about the problem is, y yes, I think if, if the features align and everything you could you couldn't you could just put like concatenate the two data sets and just run your algorithm on top of it but 
I think that might not be what you want to do. Because I think like what's interesting about this problem is that you might want to use this clinical trial data and the observational data in some smart way. So because the so the clinical trial data, what will probably be the case is that the um, like it's much smaller, like the data set will be probably much smaller, much more limited support, but the quality will be a lot higher because what you can imagine, like in the first place, you don't like if if it's if treatment is assigned by a coin flip, then you don't have like any kind of covariate shift induced uh, selection bias. Um, but you also like you might need a lot less or well the assumptions that we usually make in causal inference which is this unconf unconfoundedness um, assumption so there's no hidden confounders in a clinical trial that definitely like that definitely holds whereas with the observational data you kind of have this issue that you might you don't even know if you're if this um if this assumption holds so if you can somehow use the clinical trial to de-bias whatever comes out of the observational data model. So like if you are actually treat, like I think what's most interesting in this case is to actually treat the two data sets differently because one of them, like one of them is very large, which is the observational data. Um, so you can like, you can use that to fit very complex models, but the other one might be small, but very valuable. So you might want to use that in a smart way um, to somehow de-bias the, the models. How? I'm also not sure, but I think it's a very interesting, um, it, it's a very interesting distinction between these two data sets that you want, might want to incorporate. So you want to penalize like the find, findings from one, found, found from one data set for one reason, and then yeah. f penalize the other data set for the other reason, and probably try yes. to make one, one algorithm to account for both of those, so to maybe like recognize which population the sample was drawn from and then kind of account for the assumptions that were related to that data set of the, that particular item. Great, thank you both. Shall we go, Peter had a question or a remark as well. Hi, Peter. Hi, Mahila. Um, yeah, I was going to add to uh, another point to, to your list of differences between observational studies and clinical trials. Um, I think another difference is that in clinical trials, because they are more strictly planned, there tends to be a smaller attrition rate or dropout rate, and also less missing data. So one of the things in observational data sets is that you'll have a lot of missing data, potentially. And that can uh, be a problem in your modeling, particularly if you're not accounting for missing covariates. Um, so perhaps you could also learn the other way around, and you, you could take clinical trial data as a clean data set in a sense, and yes, okay, so it, it's gonna have fewer time points perhaps and smaller sample sizes, but you could get a handle on the effects of missing data, for example. Um, very, very good, very interesting. Of course, there is missing data even in clinical trials, but um, you are right that the type, the nature of this missing data may be different and that can be very informative. So, wow, I'm very delighted with all these discussions and good ideas. I, I almost wonder whether we should do one more question and then maybe we can stop for this time and then maybe we move to, so Nick, maybe a final question and then we can transfer my other questions to next session. Yeah, so, so this one is good for this current discussion given the presentation of Iwana. So we have discussed one way to model continuous treatments in the Saigon paper of Iwana, but are there other ways to do that? Can you think of other ways to deal with continuous treatments? And that's a question to everyone. Inclusively Iwana, who may have better ideas on how to do her own paper. I think we may have hit a little bit of a wall with this one in terms of um, opinions, discussions, questions. If you want, we can skip to our fourth or... Um, no, I guess I don't what really mind. we can do is, I think I'm, I'm very happy with the discussion. I think it's a good time to wrap up and maybe I transfer and um, change a little bit. Oh, actually, no, maybe there is one of them that I think we have about the um, assumptions we are making with respect to... Um, Got it. Yeah, I can show that one. Yeah, so maybe Basically you can share skipping, that one. skipping to number five. Here yeah, we go. Skip, skip to number five. 
So I have another final question to all of you. So given the typical IT assumptions, can we think of ways to relax them even partially and how? Yarun, maybe I can start with you. Yeah, sure. So one of these assumptions is, is that of a hidden compounder. And I have been uh, very interested in this topic as to how we can, we can deal with the hidden compounder. And there is some work on this by David Bly et al. Um, one approach would be to learn the hidden confounder, to come up with some latent confounder, see if we can learn the, this latent piece in some way that um, enforces the other assumptions to hold, for example, and see if we can, we can learn or we can also predict using that variable. Um, yeah, this is, this is, I guess, my, my only thought on that, but this is a very difficult problem. And, and I, think, I think a lot of great research would come from trying to solve it. Um, maybe I can also say something. So I think the interesting bit with these assumptions is that um, like, so, so, so usually you will be told these assumptions are too strong, whatever. And they are very, these are very strong assumptions. Um, but what I think is interesting, even if you want to relax these assumptions, you will have to introduce new assumptions. There's, there's no way around it. For example, you can relax the overlap assumption if you make, if you make some assumptions on how, um, on how models extrapolate, you know, um, but that, that is then a new assumption. I, and I think what's important here is to come up with assumptions that we can agree on are weaker and are more realistic. Um, yeah, and maybe I, different and I think that's assumptions. also very interesting. Maybe like you rightly say, Alicia, different assumptions may be in different environments and for different classes of problems, Stephen. I so think Peter, um, has, yeah, something. Peter has something to add. Let me, yeah, there we go. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, it's just following up on what Haran was saying about um, trying to learn latent variables. And that's, uh, I've been thinking about this as well. And one of the things I work on is uh, what we call in our group disease progression modeling. And one of the key things we try and learn in these models are latent variables such as at the individual level, such as disease stage. I think something like that is, is quite important when you're modeling or potentially could be quite important when you're modeling treatment effects is the stage that someone enters uh, the, you know, a, a given trial and, and so on. So I'd be interested in seeing Peter, this is a great introduction to our next meeting because in our next meeting, we shift gear to using these treatment effects and looking at time series data. So I think that's a perfect introduction. So thank you for bringing this. Nick, maybe we can wrap up and move the discussion on time series on this note to next time. And thank sure. you everyone for engaging with us. It's been fantastic. I have enjoyed it very, very much. Thank you. One second, sorry, just gonna share screen again. Um, okay, sorry about that. Okay, um, so basically to wrap up the session, um, first I'd like to talk a little bit about our next session. Um, so we've tentatively got that in for June 4th. Um, this will be, as, as my highlights already said, continuing our deep dive on ITE inference and we'll be looking at time series this time round. Um, in the meantime, I would definitely um, recommend that you take a look at some of the content that I introduced earlier on ITE inference. Um, for example, our kind of written overview and primer, as well as the uh, video tutorial series that we produced recently. Um, in the meantime as well, uh, you know, if, if you want more information about our next sessions, uh, you can either visit our dedicated page for Inspiration Exchange, um, which you can see on the, on the slide here, or of course I will drop you the occasional email with uh, basically what we have planned in the near future. Um, if you do have any friends or colleagues that you think might be interested in joining these sessions, please do let them know because word of mouth is of course very important to us and we are trying to build a kind of community with these sessions. Other than that, um, Thank you all so much for joining. Thanks so much for your questions and your opinions. Um, I you know, thought there was a really impressive amount of engagement this time. Um, it's absolutely fantastic to see. So I'm very much looking forward to our session in June. Uh, until then, please yeah, take care, uh, stay safe, and see you next time. Thanks very much.